must all be true. Let us listen to the call of love. Science hope is ringing, coming from the throne of Number 650. Number 650. Send the light. Let's sing the first, third, and last of Send the Light. Sola, Sami, Do, So. There's a call comes ringing on the restless waves. Send the light. Send the light. Send the light. There are souls to say, send the light, 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 send the
Well, I'll ask you if you'd be with Brother Jacob, if he brings forth that lesson tonight, ask him, help him say the things that he has studied and help us as listeners to take what he says and apply it to our lives and study it on. And also be able to spread your word to others, Father. Father, I ask you if you'd be with all the sick and afflicted, all the ones that need the prayers this time, uh, the ones that's has gone through surgeries and has gone through recovery. And also, Father, I ask if you'll be with these all these answered prayers that we've had here lately. Father, help us always know that they come from you. Father, I ask if you'll be with all the shut-ins, the ones that wish they could be with us. And Father, I ask if you'll be with our military and their families, help them to have you in their hearts at all times. Father, again, we have so many things to be thankful for. Just ask if you'll be with us as we go through these next three nights, this meeting going on, help us to always remember you and, and what you stand for. Again, Father, we just thank you for everything that you do. Forgive us our sins. Through Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We will glorify the King of Kings. We will glorify the Lamb. We will glorify the Lord of Lords, who is the great I Am. Lord Jehovah reigns in majesty. We will bow before His throne. We will worship Him. very good to be here with you this evening. We really appreciate the invitation to come back. We came last year and you had us back again, surprisingly. <laughs> so anyway, we're, we're thankful to be here. We're grateful to be here. It's wonderful to see uh, each of you. There's a lot of people here I don't know as well. And thank you for being here. If you're visiting from the community, uh, we especially want to welcome you and hope that, hope that everything that we do this evening you'll find in accordance with God's Word. And we hope that you'll be strengthened and encouraged and that you'll come back uh, each night this week. If you would, take out a Bible and turn with me to 2 Kings chapter 5. Second Kings chapter 5. We're going to begin this evening by reading this chapter. I was talking with Nell before the service, and I said, Nell, do you say the name Naaman or Naaman? And she says, oh, I call him Naaman. <laughs> so, I call him Naaman. I'm not sure what you call him, but anyway, that's what we're going to go with this evening. 2 Kings chapter 5, starting in verse number 1, the Bible says, Now Naaman, commander of the army of the king of Syria, was a great and honorable man in the eyes of his master, because by him the Lord had given victory to Syria. He was a mighty man of valor, but he was a leper. 
And the Syrians had gone out on raids and had brought back captive a young girl from the land of Israel. She waited on Naaman's wife. Then she said to her mistress, If only my master were with the prophet who was in Samaria, for he would heal him of his leprosy. And Naaman went in and told his master, saying, Thus and thus said the girl who is, in the, who is from the land of Israel. Then the king of Syria said, Go now, and I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So he departed and took with him ten talents of silver, shekels of gold, and ten changes of clothing. Then he brought the letter to the king of Israel, which said, Now be advised, when this letter comes to you, that I have sent Naaman my servant to you, that you may heal him of his leprosy. And it happened that when the king of Israel read the letter, that he tore his clothes and said, Am I God to kill and make alive, that this man sends a man to me to heal him of his leprosy? Therefore, please consider and see how he seeks a quarrel with me. So it was when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes, that he sent to the king, saying, Why have you torn your clothes? Please let him come to me, and he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. Then Naaman went with his horses and chariots, and he stood at the door of Elijah's house. And Elisha sent a messenger to him, saying, Go and wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh shall be restored to you, and you shall be clean. But Naaman became furious, and went away and said, Indeed, I said to myself, Surely he will come out to me and stand, and call on the name of the Lord, and wave his hand over the place, and heal the leprosy. Are not the Arbana and the Parfar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in rage. And his servants came near and spoke to him and said, My father, if the prophet had told you to do something great, would you not have done it? How much more then when he says to you, Wash and be clean? So he went down and dipped seven times in the Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God, and his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. And he returned to the man of God, he and all of his aides, and came and stood before them, and he said, Indeed, now I know that there is no God in Israel, there is no God in all the earth except in Israel. Now therefore, please take a gift from your servant. But he said, if the Lord lives before whom I stand, I will receive nothing. And he urged him to take it, but he refused. So Naaman said, Then, if not, please let your servants be given two mule loads of earth, for your servant will no longer offer either burnt offering or sacrifice to other gods, but to the Lord. Yet in this thing may the Lord pardon your servant. When my master goes to the temple of Rimen to worship there, and he leans on my hand, and I bow down in the temple of Rimen, when I bow down in the temple of Rimen, may the Lord please pardon your servant in this thing. Then he said to him, Go in peace. So he departed from him a short distance. But Gehazi, the servant of Elisha, the man of God, said, Look, my master has spared Naaman this Syrian, while not receiving from his hands what he brought. But as the Lord lives, I will run after him and take something from him. So Gehazi pursued Naaman. When Naaman saw him running after him, he got down from the chariot to meet him and said, Is all well? And he said, All is well. My master sent me, saying, Indeed, just now, two sons of the sons of the prophet, two young men of the sons of the prophet, had come to me from the mountains of Ephraim. Please give them a talent of silver and two changes of garments. So Naaman said, Please, take two talents. And he urged him and bound two talents of silver in two bags with two changes of garments and handed them to two of his servants, and they carried him on ahead of him. And when he came to the citadel, he stood from their hand, and stored them away in the house. Then he let the men go, and they departed. Now he went in and stood before his master, and Elisha said to him, Where did you go, Gehazi? And he said, Your servant did not go anywhere. Then he said to him, Did not my heart go with you when the man turned back from his chariot to meet you? Is it time to receive money and to receive clothing, olive groves and vineyards, sheep and oxen, male and female servants? Therefore the leprosy of Naaman shall cling to you and your descendants forever. And he went out from, the pre from his presence leprous as white as snow. As white as snow. You're probably familiar with the story of Naaman. You're familiar with how he was a commander of the Syrian army. He was a man that had valor. A man that perhaps people looked up to. But he had a problem. 
He was a leper. He had this disease that was fatal and a disease that was known. Disease that was known. Yet he encounters this prophet of God through this little girl that was a servant. And then he washes in the Jordan based off of Elisha's command and he's healed. And then he's able to return to Syria full of joy. And a lot of times we look at this story and we go, wow, what a great illustration of God's plan of salvation. What a great illustration. And we read in the Old Testament and we can build upon this precept of baptism of, well, in Genesis chapter 6, the flood, we, we see this world baptism. And then it's narrowed down and we see the children of Israel pass through the Red Sea. And then we see this individual baptism for physical cleansing in this story of Naaman. But tonight, rather than looking at this story as one that foreshadows salvation, I want to look at this story as a story of evangelism. Evangelism is an interesting topic. It's not something that we're all comfortable with. It's something that a lot of times gets put onto other people, specific people, maybe someone that we want to ordain, someone that we want to pay to do a job for us. But the Bible is very straightforward, that as Christians, as members of God's kingdom, we have a, a duty, we have a job, each of us individually, to spread God's Word. To spread God's Word. And what we're going to see this evening is that while each of us have this job, not all of us serve the same roles. There's not just one role that needs to be done. There's not just one thing that needs done. But there's many things. There's many different aspects, many roles that need to be filled. And the beauty of the church is that when each of us come together and everyone fulfills the role that needs to be taken place, then we can be successful as we strive to bring others to Christ. Strive to bring others to Christ. So as you think about who Naaman was, we know that he was a leper. And a, a little bit about leprosy, you know, it was a terrible skin disease, but it was uncurable. And ultimately it would lead to death. And as you think about who Naaman was, he was one that did not know who the true God was. He didn't know who the Lord was. But through this process and through the story that we just read, we understand that Naaman became clean. He became a clean man, free from this disease. He was cured from his terminal disease, and he now knows the true God. And so what we want to do is we want to look at this process that took place, this process from this dirty, sinful man to this clean man. And how did he get there? And who impacted him while he was going there? 2 Kings chapter 5, verses 2-4. through 4. The Bible says, And the Syrians had gone out on raids and had brought back captive a young girl from the land of Israel. She waited on Naaman's wife. Then she said to her mistress, If only my master were with the prophet who is in Samaria, for he would heal him of his leprosy. And Naaman went in and told his master, saying, Thus and thus said the little girl who is from the land of Israel. So I want to ask you in this story, what good were the kings? What good were the kings? You had this king of Syria send a letter to the king of Israel, two men that what? Were rich, they were popular, successful. They were men that we would expect to have all the answers. They were the leadership of the country. But what good are they? We can see that this king sends the letter to the king of Israel, and the king of Israel says, oh, he's just trying to pick a fight with me. They're just feuding. <laughs> They're no good to Naaman. They're no good to this full man. But think about who the little servant girl was. First off, she was a woman. She was a woman in a culture that had, had no... Sorry, my mics are jumping back and forth. She was a woman in a culture that had no respect for women. She was a servant, just a slave that was taken captive in a war. She didn't have any standing. But what did she have? She must have had a reputation, right? She had a reputation of someone that was from the land of Israel. She must have been true to her religion, true to her customs. In fact, she was so low on the totem pole that the Bible doesn't even name her. She doesn't even have a name. But she was the one that introduced hope into the life of this dying man. 
She was the one that saw Naaman, this man in this pitiful state, that was going to die from a terminal disease. And she said, hey, there's a way you can be saved. There's a way that you can be saved. So let's bring that to our lives today. Who are, who are the little servant girls today? Right? It's interesting to ask that question in a room full of grown men. <laughs> but who are the servant girls? These are, these are people, men and women, that may not be great teachers. They may not be someone that's eloquent with words, someone that knows the Scriptures well or definitely. They may not have the experience. They can be young. They may not know how to handle certain situations. may not be someone that can thoroughly study the Bible through with someone and teach them the things that they need to know to be saved. But the little servant girls are someone that's willing to talk about Jesus with other people. Someone that's willing to have courage and stand up and say, I can introduce you to someone that can get you to where you need to be. I can take you to a place where they're going to teach you the things that need to be taught. I can introduce you to men and women that can study with you. See, the little servant girl was full of courage. She was low on the totem pole. She was unimportant. Yet without her, Naaman would not have been saved. The next character that we read about in this story is, is Elisha, the prophet. Starting in verse number 9, the Bible says, Then Naaman went with his horses and chariot, and he stood at the door of Elisha's house. And Elisha sent a messenger to him, saying, Go and wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh shall be restored to you, and you shall be clean. See, what's interesting about Elisha is that he had the answers. Elisha had the answers. He knew how to save Naaman. He knew what Naaman needed to do to be cleansed from his sickness, his illness. But he had no relationship with Naaman. He would, have never, he would have never known who Naaman was. He would have never crossed paths with Naaman. You see, Elisha was important, but he wasn't the most important. It not only took Elisha, but it also took the servant girl. What's interesting about Elisha, though, is that when the opportunity presented himself, whenever he was faced with, with an opportunity to offer someone salvation, he was ready. He was ready to give an answer. He was ready to convince Naaman of what he needed to do to be saved. So this is less awkward, but who are the Elishas in the audience? Who are those of you that are comfortable if someone needs to be able to bring someone to you to study with? Is it something that you're working towards in your life? I believe that the answer, the plan of salvation is something that each Christian needs to be working towards. That, that each of us can present this and study with someone that we meet or someone that's brought to us in our lives. And that's who Elisha was in this story. He was a man that was ready to give Naaman the direction that Naaman needed. No one can be everywhere. And no one can know everyone that needs to know the gospel. And so the point is that we have to be ready to give people the direction that they need. The direction that they need. So we can take two characters from our story so far and we can see that without the servant girl and without, of Eli without Elisha, Naaman could not have been saved. And I want you to know that there's people in your life, there's neighbors that you have, there's friends that you have, that can't be saved without you. There's people in your life that will never know God, that will never know His plan of salvation, unless you're willing to tell them, or unless you're willing to teach them. And so this story, while it seems like a long time ago, a distant way off, it's something that is very personal and something that's very applicable to each of our lives. The next group of people that we want to talk about tonight are the servants. The servants. Starting in verse number 11. It says, But Naaman became furious and went away and said, Indeed, I said to myself, He will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over the place and heal the leprosy. 
Are not the Abanal and the Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in rage. And his servants came near and spoke to him and said, My father, if the prophet had told you to do something great, would you not have done it? How much more than when he says to you, Wash and be clean? So he went down and dipped seven times in the Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God. And his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. So it's interesting, verses 11 through 12, what we see is someone that is very like people in our world today. They want to show. Naaman wanted Elisha to come out and make a big spectacle of what was going on. He said, I thought you would come out and wave your hand. I thought you were going to do something cool. Maybe a show would go on. And then I'd be saved, and it'd be something really neat. And everyone would see it. But like Naaman, the plan of salvation is the same way. It's not something that's showy. It's not something that's complicated. It's not something that everyone has to see or something great. But what is it? It's something as simple as, as repenting, believing, and being baptized. And we see people are faced with this and they say, I don't like that. (laughs) I don't like that. And if we're being the little servant girls and if we're being the Elishas, then people are going to come and they're going to hear the gospel message and we're going to teach them the gospel message. And you know what's going to happen? They're going to say, I don't know if I like that. I don't know if I don't know if that's what I want to do. And you know what it's going to take? It's going to take relationships. It's going to take people like these servants that embedded themselves into Naaman's life and whenever he heard hard sayings, whenever he heard things that he didn't necessarily like, they were able to tell him the truth and he was able to listen. Whenever Elisha said, go and dip in the Jordan seven times, he said, I don't like that. I don't want to do that. These servants had a close enough relationship with him. These servants knew him well enough. He respected them enough that they could come to him and they'd say, look, we know it's hard. We know it's not what you wanted. But if you want to be saved, it's what you got to do. And that's what it's going to take. That's what it takes from the people in this room as we, as we build relationships with people. And they're broad and they hear hard things that that we're able to reason with them and we're able to show them love and we're able to be their friend so that when the hard times come and the hard sayings come, they can know that we're being honest with them, that we have their best interest at heart. Because Naaman didn't like the direction that he received. In fact, he was furious. He was mad. But without the servant's relationship, he would have died. He would have been lost. And like we talked about, sometimes the truth is difficult. And sometimes when we think about people that come to Jesus, they have to change everything that they've ever been taught. The concepts, the principles, the truths are new to them. It's not things they understand. It's not things that necessarily make sense to them. But what it takes is relationships. And what it takes is caring for them. It takes us involving themselves involving ourselves in their lives so that we can be there to help them, just like the servants were there to help Naaman. So as we've talked about the story of Naaman tonight, I want to ask you, what character are you in our story? Maybe you're Naaman. Maybe you need to be saved. Maybe you're someone that can talk to people. You're someone that's comfortable inviting people to church. You're comfortable inviting people to a Bible study. You can be a little servant girl. That's great, and it takes little servant girls. Maybe you're someone that's comfortable studying with someone. You're comfortable teaching someone the plan of salvation, going through the Bible with them and teaching them the way to be reconciled back to God, even though that we're sinners. And that's great. Maybe you see yourself as a servant. Maybe you have relationships with people, and you're able to speak objectively to them. You're able to talk the truth with them. And when they hear the hard things, you're able to keep them in the fold. You're able to keep them coming back so they can hear what they need to hear so they can ultimately be saved. 
But the truth of the matter is, each of us is probably a little bit of all of these. Maybe not all of them, but maybe two of them. And what I want to encourage you to do is figure out which one you are or which one you aren't and get better. Get better. Think about the courage that it will take to talk to someone, to invite someone to church. We have a great opportunity between tonight and tomorrow night or Sunday. Invite someone to come. Invite someone to come and hear God's Word. Maybe you're someone that's comfortable speaking with someone, comfortable teaching them God's plan. I want to encourage you to keep doing that. Continue to do that and get better at preaching God's Word. Maybe you're a servant and you can be friends with someone. That's great. What I don't want you to be tonight is the last character we're going to talk about. And that character is Gehazi. The character of Gehazi. Verse number 25, the Bible says, Now he went in, speaking of Gehazi, and he stood before his master, and Elisha said to him, where did you go, Gehazi? And he said, Your servant did not go anywhere. Now, I've got little kids here. <laughs> and Charles is just getting to the age where he can understand, you know, what he's doing. He understands a little bit about lying. And there's times where Parker will be crying in the other room. And you'll say, Charles, come here. And Charles runs in. And you say, What'd you do to your sister? What does he do? I don't know what you're talking about, right? And that's, that's the image that I have here of Gehazi. Gehazi has done something that he knows is wrong, right? Elisha wasn't going to accept a gift from, from the Syrian, from Naaman. He says, we're not going to do that. And Gehazi goes, I've got a better idea. I think we should. We did do something after all. So he goes and he collects what he thinks is rightfully his, then he comes back and tells Elijah, I don't know what you're talking about. I didn't go anywhere. I didn't go anywhere. You know, it's interesting, as we read about God, right as he's introduced, he's called a servant of God. He's called a servant of God. You know who Gehazi was in today's terms? Gehazi was a Christian. He was someone that was at church. Someone that sat in the pews that we sit in, right? But I want to ask you, where was Gehazi in the conversion of Naaman? Where was Gehazi at? Was he helping Naaman? Was he introducing Naaman to Elijah? No. Was he help teaching Gehazi or leading him into what he needed to do to be saved? No. Was he encouraging Gehazi when he didn't want to do? Sorry, was he encouraging Naaman when he didn't want to do what Elisha said? No. See, Gehazi had problems in his own life that prevented him from helping others. Gehazi was greedy. He was greedy. He wasn't looking for a way to help others. He wasn't looking for a way to bring others into the fold or to, or to make sure other people knew about salvation. He was looking for, out for his own self. He was looking for a way to make his life easier, his life better. He was looking inwardly, not outwardly. You know, there's what I would call lifelong Christians. Lifelong Christians. People that sit in the pews their entire life. And they refuse to deal with their own sin. They refuse to deal with their own sin. And what does it do? It makes us ineffective in the kingdom of God. Gehazi was not effective in helping Naaman. And if we have sin in our life, if you have sin in your life tonight, then you can't be successful in spreading God's Word. You can't be successful in any of the roles that we talked about previously. So what I want to encourage you to do this evening is look inwardly. Take a look inwardly. What's preventing you from spreading the Gospel? Is there sin in your life? Is there things in your life that you haven't taken care of? Things in your life that you need to change? 2 Kings chapter 5, verse number 27. The final verse, it says, Therefore the leprosy of Naaman shall cling to you and your descendants forever. And he went out from his presence, leprous, white as snow. Which one are you this evening? Are you someone that's aiding the cause of Christ? Are you someone that's 
helping bring others to Christ? Or are you like Gehazi? You're not interested in helping others. You're only interested in helping yourself. This evening, if you need to make a change in your life, we want to encourage you to do that. If you have problems, sin problems, we can help you with that. We can pray for you. We can baptize you. If there's something that you need from the congregation, please come at this time as together we stand and sing the song of invitation. talking about the relationship between grace and faith. So the theme of the meeting is faith, and our next lessons will be about faith. So tomorrow we'll talk about grace and how it's related to faith. Thank you. Thank you, Jacob. We'll, uh, we'll look forward to that lesson tomorrow night and appreciate your lesson tonight. Appreciate all of you that have come to be with us tonight. I was just sitting there thinking, I guess we had several servant girls in the congregation because we've got a good crowd tonight and I know a lot of people have been inviting people to be here and so we appreciate that and appreciate your being here. Just uh, real quickly some of the things going on the rest of the weekend. If you're able to stay with us for a little while we'll have some ice cream next door. Some of it's homemade. Uh, I know there's some strawberry that's really good and uh, some of it may not was made in someone's home maybe not one of us but Anyway, there will be plenty of ice cream next door if you can stay with us. Uh, tomorrow evening at 5, we're going to have a pizza supper prior to the service. And remember, our assembly tomorrow night will be at 7 p.m. So we'll meet at 7 tomorrow night. And then, of course, Sunday at 10.30 and 1.30. Uh, still, as Jacob said, not there's an opportunity still to invite your friends and neighbors. So uh, if you know of someone you haven't invited yet, we'll see if they will come with you tomorrow night. Do any of you visiting brethren have any announcements that you want to make at this time? Be happy to announce. Yes, Jeff? Uh, if you would announce our meeting at New Home, uh, that would be May the, I believe it's the 19th, that's Friday. Friday night, Friday night, Sunday with Brother Lee Adair. Okay, Lee Adair will be over at uh, New Home, uh, the, the middle, that's probably the third Sunday in May, probably, something like that, so. If you can go over there, I know you'll enjoy that. Uh, if you'll turn to number 845, I want to sing that before we close tonight. And Brother Mario, will you, will you dismiss us after this song, please? Let's stand and we'll sing this, and then Brother Mario will dismiss us. Amen. 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 
you father for your grace we praise you father because you are the only God the only true God and we praise you Lord because in your grace and your love you design a way for us to be reconciled to you and we thank you father for sending your son to die for us on the cross thank you father for your grace and the love that you extended to us so that we can now be called your children, children of God, redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father, for your word that has come to us in the scripture through your different servants, Father, so that we can also know that salvation through the years. Thank you, Father, for those who in the past dedicated their life and even gave their life for being us that message. And even today, Lord, thank you for those who throughout the world are sharing, Father, that gospel of salvation. Father, I pray that tonight your message remain in our hearts and in our minds and to be an encouragement, Lord, to share that salvation with others, to share that knowledge that we have, Father. Just as we came to know Christ, Father, help us to have the courage and the words to share with others how they can also be reconciled to you. Thank you for Brother Jacob, Father, and others that so willingly dedicate their life to spread the gospel. And thank you for all of those who are here tonight, Lord, because there is encouragement to be able to be with brothers and sisters of the same mind and of the same desire to glorify you, to serve you, and to reach out to others, Father, with the message of salvation. I pray, Lord, that you bless your word in our hearts and in our minds tonight. And as we depart from this place, Father, please lead us to our home in safety. In Jesus' name, amen.